Sponsored by Raid Shadow Legends. I'm outside the criminal courts building where the trial that's set to get America talking even more than O.J. Simpson's is just about to begin. 23-year-old Calvin Brodus, a.k.a. Snoop Doggy Dog, the man who made gangster rap mainstream, stands accused of murder. 1993 was a simpler time for Snoop Dogg. Back then, Doggy Star was just known as a harmless sex position saved for facially impaired women. A young Tupac Shakur was just taken over the rap game and it would be several years before his tragic disappearance. And of course, in South London, your boy Trap Law Ross was just being born. So for many reasons, it was the last year that hip-hop would truly be safe. Over the past few years, we've really seen Snoop Dogg overhaul his image. He went from G-checking, G-funk gangster to squeaky clean media mogul real quick. And as a result, over the later stages of Snoop Dogg's career, he's been able to rub shoulders with some of the biggest names in American celebrity culture. From the likes of culinary tax criminal Martha Stewart, accused regular tax criminal Donald Trump, and even legendary singer-songwriter Seal. These days, Snoop Dogg's public persona is so squeaky clean, it's hard to imagine him gangbanging and toting a strap. But many people have forgotten that in 1993, Snoop Dogg actually caught a body and spent the next two years of his career come up with a murder charge hanging over his head. And this is the story of that murder charge. Now a message from our sponsor. I want to shout out Raid Shadow Legends, the most Chris immersive Rich. RPG on road right now. Oh, and did I mention it's free? Young Shish is one to mess with now. So if you're gonna play games with me, make sure it's Raid Shadow, Shadow Legends. Play it. The 3D graphics are epic. Sick. And it's got mad boss fights. Yeah, that's right. A six story line and hundreds of champions for you to collect and custom eyes. Oh, yeah. It's got PvP battles too. What? So you can take on all, all of your ops. ops. If you support Raid Shadow Legends, Legends, then you're supporting Trap Law Ross. So get it. So go download that now. Get it now. And say that you got it from me. So you did. And use my link in description to get 50,000 silver free. free. Plus a free epic champion. What? It's in the Apple and Google Store. But Weight Trap Law is the game any good? Yeah, it's got a near perfect score. Ten out so ten. who had the most ambitious RPG of 2019? Raid? Yeah, Raid Shadow Legends. Go download today. On August 24th, 1993, Snoop Dogg was involved in an altercation outside of his apartment. Allegedly, Snoop had gotten into it with a chap named Philip Waldemarium. Whilst they were both members of the Crips, apparently they belonged to different sets of the gang, and Waldemarium was upset about Snoop moving in on his turf. And to be fair to him, if Snoop Dogg really wanted to mark the turf as his, he should have pissed everywhere when he moved in. Good dog. Now, this victim was reportedly already known to Snoop and was a member of the By Yourself Hustler Crips. This crew is actually known to be affiliated with the Rolling 60s neighborhood Crips, famous for being repped by Nipsey Hussle. Snoop was a member of the Long Beach Insane Crips, or as they're known in today's politically correct world, the Long Beach Suffering from a Long-Term Mental Health Illness Crips. <laughs> Other LA gang sets that you might not have heard of include the Maxi Pad Female Bloods, the Trolling 50s Keyboard Crips, and of course the Trey Gay LGBTQ69 Rainbow Bloods. And of course Rapper 6 9 is famously a member of all of them. Supposedly Waldemarian was already known to Snoop for having threatened and insulted him in the past, and he just got out of jail for letting off a gun in a schoolyard. Man, YNW Melly stole his whole style from this guy. Now, allegedly, the altercation started when somebody flashed a gang sign at Waldemarian whilst driving by. Apparently disrespected by this blatant encroachment on his turf, Waldemarian decided to give the appropriate response, yelling, fuck y'all, apparently telling them, you're in by yourself hustlers territory. Well, this didn't go down too well, and apparently several people jumped into Snoop's Jeep and decided to hit the road. According to the prosecution, they followed Waldemarian and his crew a few blocks before losing them and turning off. But on the other hand, according to Snoop, they weren't following Waldemarian, and the deadly altercation occurred later on in the day whilst they were driving to the studio. But essentially, not long after that first altercation, Snoop was driving along with his bodyguard McKinley Lee and spotted Waldemarian and his friends at the nearby Palms Park having some food on a picnic table. They pulled up and apparently Waldemarian let them know, I ain't sweating you, but I'm just letting you know where you're at, i.e. on his turf. Apparently at this point, Snoop's bodyguard Lee stood up out the top of the convertible Jeep. And I want to just make a quick aside to say that convertible Jeeps are the most fire whips that you can buy. And frankly, not enough of them appear in hip hop stories. Whether it's the drop top Jeep Wrangler, the convertible Range Rover Evoque, or the absolutely fire Maybach G-Wagon Laundrette convertible, more people need to be rolling around in drop top Jeeps. Anyway, I digress. So after letting Snoop's crew know where they are, apparently somebody in Snoop's car shouted back, you ain't letting us know nothing, punk. Apparently Waldemarian replied to this saying, oh, I'm a punk and slowly reaching into his waistband for his 380. 
Snoop's bodyguard Lee saw the move and quickly fired off five shots and dropped him like it's hot. Snoop hit the gas and sped off and Walter Merriam was left dead. Meanwhile, the hustler's crew took the gun from Walter Merriam's body and hid it, assumingly by themselves, to try and cover for their dead friend, though investigators did find that gun a few months later. But if that wasn't crazy enough, Snoop Dogg decided to go full take a and start doing the race. He went on the run and managed to evade the cops for a whole damn week. Yes, like a greased up ODB, Slippery Snoop managed to evade the police in one of the most spectacular finesses in hip hop history. Allegedly, he told his management what had went down at the time and they didn't turn him in. Supposedly, Snoop actually wanted to turn himself in, but allegedly Death Row Records head honcho and amateur off-road trucker Suge Knight decided that he wanted to use the Snoop murder case and Snoop being on the run as publicity for his upcoming album Doggy Style. So, Suge concocted a plan to make sure that Snoop could still make an appearance at the 1993 VMA before he would surrender to police. Damn, it's always drama at the VMAs, isn't it? For me to make this dude the most hottest artist in the world, people gotta see him. So I know we're taking up his chance, but at the same time, it's his job to be an artist and promote this stuff. And then when they come to arrest him, it's my job to get him out of there. So, Snoop appeared at the VMAs doing chilled out interviews with Dr. Dre and presenting the award for best R&B, all while knowing that he had this murder charge over his head and he would be arrested when he left the venue. I'm actually stunned that they even allowed this to happen, frankly. In keeping with that theme, they should have also had OJ Simpson present the award for best female singer before immediately killing her on stage and writing a fucking book about it. Man, the VMAs used to be lit, didn't they? So immediately after his appearances were done, Suge discreetly arranged for Snoop to be taken in by the LAPD. However, knowing the LAPD, a discreet surrender probably involves six broken ribs and having crack planted on you. However, miraculously, Snoop was bailed on this murder charge for a $1 million bond that was put up by Suge Knight. But what's really interesting is it actually took around two years for this case to actually end up going to trial. So, murder rap hanging over your head, classic album in the chamber, and death row records at its peak, it's time for Suge and Snoop to settle in for a very long finesse. Snoop put out Doggy Style in November, just three months after this killing happened. And by God, did it blow up. It sold 800,000 copies in the first week, and by the end of the next year, it had sold over 4 million copies. 4 million. This was partly boosted by the inclusion of Snoop Dogg's track Murder Was The Case on the album, which fans went crazy for. This isn't dissimilar to what happened with YNW Melly recently. After he caught a double murder case for allegedly killing his two childhood friends, his song Murder On My Mind absolutely blew up with fans calling it a potential confession, despite the fact that it was recorded before these killings even took place. Now, frankly, I'm too scared to commit a real crime to try and get my rap career off the ground. But I want to get in on this finesse, so I've decided to boost my own street cred by creating songs about minor infractions that I'll be committing instead of murders. As I look up at the park, eating all my snack crumbs spilling, and the bin is so far. Sitting thinking, should I walk to the trash or throw my garbage on the floor? Fuck the law and just dash. My letter habits got Greenpeace cursing. Only thing I recycle is my bars and my verse. Throw the paper on the floor like it's not mine. But a cop saw and gave a 20 pound fine. Littering's the case that they gave me. 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 But things didn't stop there, and in what looked like a pretty boss move, in 1994, Snoop Dogg actually released a short film to accompany the song under the same title, Murder Was The Case. This was a semi-autobiographical film which seemingly depicted Snoop Dogg doing the killing as well as being killed as part of a gangland altercation. But some question this move as an overt attempt to try and change public opinion about the case and influence the jury. This film essentially positioned him as the victim and definitely acting in self-defense, putting that idea out there before the court actually had a chance to present the facts of the case to a jury. This was actually a pretty smart move, and to be honest, since I'm due to go to court for several littering infractions, I'm actually planning to drop my own 15-minute short film, entitled Littering Was The Case They Gave Me.
Considering the fact that I was born in 1993, I'll admit that when I first saw Murder Was The Case, I didn't really get it. Being about 14 months old at the time of the release, I couldn't really get my head around some of the more deeper social constructs of the movie. As an infant, I wasn't really tuned into the subtleties of the Los Angeles gang scene. Although I will admit, I was a mean crip walker. However, returning to it now, this short film is an epic affair. It was directed by Dr. Dre and Fab Five Freddy and seemingly depicts Snoop Dogg getting into a gang altercation and having a shootout. Initially, he's killed, but he's able to make a deal with the devil and come back to do it all over again. Frankly, the film had everything you could possibly want. Shootouts that look like something out of GTA 5. Gratuitous murder of ambulance drivers. Yeah, he's trying to save the injured. Kill him, kill him. To be honest, I was quite shocked at the amount of violence against paramedics in this film, especially when you consider the fact that the movie was directed by a doctor. But most importantly, this film has what every good film should have. Charlie Murphy! RIP Charlie Murphy, man. He's one of the greatest comedians of all time. But jokes aside, essentially the entire film just looks like one big opportunity for Snoop Dogg to essentially seize the narrative of the film before this murder case went to trial. It shows a version where Snoop doesn't shoot first and ends up getting killed. We then see him making a deal with the devil, getting another chance to do it over again. Snoop then becomes the one doing the killing, but is then immediately arrested and sent to jail. So even though he ends up in jail, at least Snoop Dogg gets a second chance at life, and he immediately makes good use of that second chance by shanking someone up in prison. He then has a go at shanking the prison guards before immediately being shanked himself. Hey, what do you expect when you make a deal with the devil? Snoop also closed out 1994 with a spectacular performance at that year's VMAs. He came out in a wheelchair, which I can only assume was a tribute to the Roland 20s handicapped Crips, and also ended his performance by claiming he was innocent. I'm innocent. But apparently, that's not how the legal system works, so he still had to go to trial. Some people were out for Snoop Dogg's blood in the lead up to this case. Even the Daily Star ran a front page story calling Snoop an evil bastard. Others showed support in the lead up to the trial. Tupac claimed that it was Love Snoop Dogg Day, the day that he got out of jail, though sadly that never caught on as a national holiday. MC Hammer came out to support Snoop Dogg's innocence, and I assume that he did that while shitting into a gold toilet and wiping his ass with money. So, the evidence is compiled. Snoop Dogg has had amazing success with Doggy Style, and his Murder Was The Case short film and album. So finally, in 1995, it's time for him to face trial. Snoop immediately assembles the Dream Team, bringing in Johnny Cockring, fresh off of the OJ case, but six years before he would go on to represent P. Diddy in his gun charge. Snoop and Suge Knight allegedly purchased Johnny Cochran's $500,000 itchy trigger finger package, which entitles the buyer to get off on one murder on a self-defense basis, non-transferable, and women and children are an extra $200,000 ahead. This is frankly a bargain compared to his $2 million OJ Simpson an approved family pack, or his $5 million non-refundable Tukey Williams unlimited murder spree package. And the fact that this was paid for by Death Row Records is kind of ironic considering the fact that the only people saving you from Death Row are Death Row. The defense's case was that the LAPD had been sloppy in the investigation, the LAPD lost the shell casings from the murder weapon, as well as the victim's bloody clothes, and they suggested that the police had been destroying evidence. But the LAPD clapped back saying, no, we weren't destroying evidence, we were just hiding it. Oh, wait a minute, no we weren't, whoops, or something. Prosecutors were pushing for a murder charge and they were basically suggesting that Snoop Dogg had directed his bodyguard McKinley Lee to shoot the victim in a drive-by while Snoop was driving the Jeep which he owned himself. The prosecution brought 24 witnesses to back up their case, but this completely backfired because the sheer amount of people giving their take just led to a whole bunch of conflicting accounts and confusion for the jury. The defense kept it pretty simple. They only called one witness to the stand and they put pressure on the prosecution who essentially had to admit that their side had destroyed evidence and the entire prosecution ended up being held in contempt of court. Snoop recalled his lawyers giving an emotional set of closing remarks which moved him and members of the jury to tears. He's not concerned with the money issue, and you know what I'm saying, and I knew that when he did his closing argument, you know what I'm saying? Because it brought him to tears, it brought me to tears and a couple of jurors to tears because he was actually telling them, I'm not representing Snoop Doggy Dog for Snoop Doggy Dog. I'm representing him because I love him as an individual. I knew him before this incident, I know him after this incident, and I'm giving y'all control of his life in which I've had control over for the past two and a half years. And I love this man. If you take him away, it's like you taking me away. And by February 1996, the not guilty verdict had come in. Snoop and his bodyguard Lee were completely acquitted of murder. Lee got off completely scot-free on a self-defense basis. Snoop went on to fight manslaughter and accessory to murder charges, which eventually ended in a mistrial and didn't go any further. Following the verdict, Snoop Dogg sat down for an emotional interview with MTV and took the opportunity to make some of the facts of the case clear, whilst also dropping some salt on the prosecution. He knew we was not guilty. He knew that. 
He knew McKinley Lee acted in self-defense. McKinley Lee has never, ever, ever, ever been involved with gangs. I have. McKinley Lee has never been involved with gangs. He was the trigger man. So what, what's the whole case about? Oh, it's about Snoop Dogg being gang affiliated? But Snoop Dogg didn't pull the trigger. He drove the car away from his bodyguard acting in self-defense. But if you look at them, they don't care about that. It's Snoop Dogg. We some low-life district attorneys that don't have no name, that don't got nothing going for ourselves. If we wash him up, we large. Malik done his job. His job was to protect me, protect him and anybody that was around me at any time. That's what he was hired for as a personal bodyguard. After the acquittal, Snoop Dogg publicly denounced the gangster lifestyle, saying that he felt if he continued to try and behave like a gangster, he would end up dead or in jail. I mean, it was like a certain part of my life in which I, I took the wrong route, more or less, and drifted into the, into the wrong side of life. But I mean, I was blessed enough to bank back off of that and still be alive and get a chance to do something positive. And I took that chance and did what I had to do. Following this, he moved his family into a 5,000 square foot mansion on the outskirts of LA. His next release, coming after the death of Tupac, was called The Godfather and had a noticeably toned down vibe and was a lot more G-Funk than gangster rap. He was reportedly at odds with Death Row Records and Suge Knight over royalty payments and eventually was able to leave and in 1998 signed with Master P's No Limit Records. And basically, we all know what happened after that. Snoop Dogg went on to have an amazing career, dropping countless hits and becoming one of the most culturally significant icons in hip hop and just in culture in general. Everybody knows Snoop Dogg. So that is the story of the murder charge that made Snoop Dogg the man he is today. But there is just one loose end to wrap up after all of this. I'd first off like to thank my defence team, uh, the clean team with Johnny Cochran. I really appreciate them looking out for me and they were the only people that believed in my innocence right back from the day that I committed the crime. I also want to thank my subscribers and definitely tell them to go and cop some merch from my merch store since it's cost me so much to defend myself against these littering charges. And finally, I just want to make one statement which is I can't stop, I won't stop, uh-uh, uh-uh. Littering's the case that they gave me. Littering's the case that they gave me. Hope you enjoyed that video. If you did, make sure that you go and check out my merch store. Down below, teespring.com slash store slash traplawross, I think is what the link is, something like that. Go check it out. I've got a bunch of cool merch. I design it all myself. If you like it, go cop something. If you don't, nah, I don't really want to hear it. You know what I mean? I'm just I'm doing my thing, bro. If you don't, if you don't fucks with it, nah, I don't fucks with you. You get me. You get me. Whatever. It's cool. No worries. Safe. Check it out. Thanks for watching. Peace out.